And we watched Ole Miss making these moves in the portal really the last two years, but they signed the number one portal class in the country this year. And, and we kind of talked about this idea of going all in, right? And so the, heading into their game at LSU, I, I called up uh, uh, Walker Jones, who is the CEO of their collective. He's a guy who's got a sports agency background. He'd worked for Under Armour and sports marketing for a long time. I think that's sort of kind of an under underrated portion of all of this collective conversation. I think you compare it to, you know, UNLV and the schools that, you know, that, that didn't go well and the schools that are using blueprint, the competency level of collectives, especially in the early days was very, very different. And Walker Jones came in and brought a level of competency to Ole Miss that they had not had and, and unified a lot of the collectives. But I wanted to talk about like, Hey, so how much did you guys spend, and where does this kind of look like? And then, so I talked to them before they, the LSU game a couple weeks ago, and they lost that game. So this story kind of becomes, okay, well, where do you kind of go from here if you've got two losses going into October? Ole Miss is still technically in the playoff hunt. If they win out, they'll have a shot. Uh, it'll be close. But the math says, okay, we spent all this money on a roster. It looks like we're probably not going to get into what we say, a, a pretty explicit goal. So what does that mean? And – I think the biggest takeaway, you know, especially if you read the story, is is this isn't a one year thing. This is how you build your program, and this is what college football looks like. This is, to me, this is the most important thing in college football. You cannot like it. You can love. Hey, there's some upward mobility, but the reality is, if you are not willing to spend on your roster, whether that's now or that's when Rev Share comes in, you know, as early as next year, it doesn't really matter. If you're not willing to spend on your roster and you think you're going to win, you are wrong. And I think that's kind of his point. Is like, hey, you know, I, I thought his his quote, and this is basically what he said to a lot of the donors and a lot of the people that he was courting, is, I don't know if we're going to make the playoff. I don't know if this is going to be enough. We tried our hardest. We fundraised. We tried to do everything we could. It's like, but I know how we will not make the playoff, and that is by not having a plan and not committing to it. And I think it's just that simple in, in 2024. Uh, yeah. what, and, and, what, what is to, your to idea that, of that? So to that point, the, the, the whole idea about, about the Ole Miss window was that the schedule this season was favorable. You don't mm-hmm. have the divisions anymore. You're not in the SEC West. You've got Lane Kiffin for who got a knows returning how quarterback, long. Jackson Dart. You've got a returning quarterback. Like that was the idea of this is this is when Ole Miss needs to to go in. So along those lines, do you feel like if this doesn't go as well, Ole Miss will be able to continue to keep spending uh, on that front? And have you talked to anybody since then who who feels that that might? change or not or is this what is this what walker jones expects to happen every single year and that's the pitch he's continuing to make i think it'll depend i think it depends on a lot of things you know what is the belief level in your coach what do you have at quarterback you know if you had Ole miss last year especially coming off of you know winning the peach bowl and looking really good last year uh if you want to go to somebody and say hey you know give us $100,000, $500,000, $100,000, $500,000, a million dollars to help us get over the top. It's easy to believe in that because they were so close. If you're a million miles away and everybody thinks your coach is no good and you don't have a quarterback, you're going to have a hard time getting money out of people. But there's this idea of donor fatigue, and I, I, I in micro spots, I think it exists for a lot of the reasons that I said. If the confidence level in the trajectory of your program is low, then, yeah, people are not going to want to give – but I don't understand why people think that there's this idea that, oh, NIL money is going to run out. What are you talking about? People have been giving to universities for a long time, and maybe there's some tax implications for some of this, and that maybe complicates the conversation a little bit. But the reality is people have been giving to programs that don't compete for championships for a long time, like literally you know, decades upon decades. And, hey, we want to get new bathrooms on the west side of the stadium. Hey, we want to pay for this other stadium expansion. We want to get nicer chair back seats. We want to get an upgraded weight room. We want to get all these things. People are giving to all these things that help the program, but you still need a coach to do it. Well, nothing helps in a more direct way than, hey, here's a million dollars. Let's go get a portal QB. The idea – that people who care about the program and have a lot of money are going to tire of that, I just think is a fallacy. And we have so much data of people giving to programs that, 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 that I just don't seem they think that's going to happen. And people say, oh, well, that five-star didn't work out. But guess what, Chris? 
There's five stars in every recruiting class. There's big time yeah. transfers in every class. You can find somebody that's the next guy that's going to work out and is going to take your team to the to the playoff. Yeah. Whether or not that's true, you can believe that. So the way I don't want to say pushback, but anecdotally, things I've heard from other places and in, in the idea of donor fatigue is fans are constantly being hit up every opportunity to donate to the collective, mm-hmm. uh, whether that you're at the games, whether it's your emails, it's almost like the political solicitations that we're just kind of getting nonstop And that may tire out a lot of fans who are also this year going to be asked to pay for three trips to the national championship game or four or five. If you have a conference championship game and the price of everything is kind of going up. And I do think on the margins, you're going to have some fans that are upset, especially if the team isn't winning uh, on, on that side. On the other end, the high money donors, you know, I do wonder if there's a point where after a couple of years of it not working, you think, you know, if I put my name on that new building, that's there forever or that's there for 20 years. You know, that is something that is going to stay there. It's nice to see my name out there. It's nice to get recognized and do a ribbon cutting ceremony where everybody celebrates me and how great I am. Nobody's doing that for a quarterback. You're, you're not having a press conference where a uh, well, rich donor is announcing that. Hey, no, I, I don't think that's true because if you, if you look at, okay, so the, the most public example of this, right, would be Arkansas hiring John Calipari and it leaks out that like John Tice has committed like $5 million to NIL to make sure that that's John true. Calipari can get his guys in there. Mm-hmm. that's the same thing as putting your money on the building, except the fans are like, when they see, you know, John L. Davis, whatever, throw an alley-oop to Jonas Adu, they're going to be like, John Tyson, baby, Tyson chicken, I'm going to give you some nuggets on the way home as a thank mm-hmm. you to our super booster. And not every program has a super booster, and I think you have to have a coach that understands, hey, this is an adapt-or-die world. You have to have a competent collective that knows how to fundraise and is competent and spends well. Uh, and I think... You know, we'll see what the going rate for a, you know, a a competent roster is. But if you're in that $10 million, you know, you talk to people in the collective space. If you're in that 8 to $13 million range, you're in the ball game, basically. That, that you, can, seems you can feel the race. That seems to be where it's settled because – Well, we'll you know, see. <laughs> well, because like Miami, Ohio, you're kind of more toward – Ohio State, Oregon, you're kind of more toward that $20 million is yeah. a general idea. But most people are kind of in that 10 to 15 range based on what you've heard, based on what Manny Navarro has heard. But like – so about a month ago, I'm at SMU and there's a panel being hosted. Um, Nick Saban is there. Charlie Baker is there, the NCAA president. Heather Dinich – from ESPN is, is uh, moderating this, this panel. Very nice, very nice person. Great. And so Nick Saban, so this was about NIL and the future of college sports. And what kept happening was n- instead of Heather kind of facilitating the conversation, well, she did, she did a great job, it, but it kept being Nick Saban turning to Charlie Baker <laughs> and being like, what's going on? What are we doing here? And Charlie Baker being like, I'm doing the best I can. We need help from Congress. <laughs> And there was a quote from, from Nick Saban that he says – he said that when, when, when NIL started at Alabama, they didn't have to pay as much because Alabama could promise these kids, you're going to the NFL, you're going to be a first-round pick in you know three years. Like for the Saban discount, essentially. Yes. And the quote, the quote was, he goes, we didn't have to pay them quite as much because we were selling value for the future. But each year, that got more and more difficult. And I'll just tell you, the first year we had NIL, we had $3 million. The next year, we had to have 7 The next mm-hmm. year, we had to have 10 This year, we have to have 13 So where does it end? How does it keep going? All of this money would be given to the university or to the athletic program so we could support more opportunities for non-revenue sports. And, he, and, and, and that is an example of a coach who's very frustrated with where this situation is. I'm not saying this is the reason Nick Saban retired. And there's a lot of things that, that go into that. But remember, Nick Saban was the one who called out Jimbo Fisher and Deion Sanders at that donor event where he said, we got to have more money. And it was really mm-hmm. interesting to see someone who had dominated the sport suddenly realizing, like, we need to keep up with the Joneses now. And that was kind of a new world. And those programs who got out in front at the beginning, your Ole Miss, your Tennessee, the ones that were – pushing the envelope to see how far they could go rather than waiting and seeing where it settled. Those were the ones who got out in front and, and have reaped the rewards ever since. But I think the one thing that I've taken away is that the people who rushed in and, and 
tempted, I don't want to say tempted fate, but just were way more aggressive when people were like, well, we don't know what the rules are. We want to be more tentative. Those are the people that have lost out. You know, the people that were really aggressive. You mentioned Miami, Tennessee, Texas A&M, Oregon. The people who jumped in, they've seen their program thrive. A&M aside, but they're doing great now, obviously. Uh, they've seen their programs upgrade. Oregon's in a better spot than they were when NIL started. Miami's in a much better spot when and than when NIL started. Tennessee is in a completely different stratosphere than when NIL started. A&M is doing well. Uh, who am I forgetting? Those were kind of the big ones, but you know, Texas had yeah. their own kind of plans. They're doing well. Um, everybody that, that's well funded and none of BYU. them face any B- real, B- B- BYU, BYU is a good quietly example. is kind of yes. doing really well, it's, especially in basketball. There's some stuff going on there. And what we thought at the time was the NCAA doesn't have any teeth in this. They're not going to try. If they do try, they're going to lose in court. Obviously they tested that with Tennessee, Florida state got hit with, some you know the 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 situation where the coach gave the uh, transfer kid a ride to uh, a meeting with a collective and they got hit with some penalties for that. But I don't think that's the biggest reason why Florida State is struggling. But what no. we were pretty much correct in that hey they're going to lose in court and the NCAA is not going to try and that's generally what we have seen. And the schools that were really aggressive early on are the schools that have won. And that I'm not even sure you can call it a gamble because you and I were talking about this. Our whole staff was talking about this and kind of reading the tea leaves is that I thought it's not that big of a gamble to be really aggressive here because the penalties are not going to be that serious if they come down and there's probably not going to be any. And we're sitting here now as we lean toward the house settlement and rev share. And that looks like that's the case that if you said, you know, screw it, we're going all in on NIL. You, you'd be hard pressed to find anybody in the entire sport. That regrets any part of that at this point. And, and, and there have been some that didn't quite work, like Texas A&M uh, wasn't quite there, had to fire Jimbo. That was well, kind of a but mess. That, but, that's, but that, but that but worked, what, 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 They, well, they signed what, the best what, recruiting class in, in college football history. They, they just did, Jimbo and then and and half, those kids are, half those kids are gone now. But you sure, also but had that's Miami, not Jimbo. My, so anyway. You had, you had Miami doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. It wasn't working. And now it's working. What like Like if you keep – taking a swing at it, eventually you're going to get a Cam Ward and it's somebody who can really take your program to the next level.